Please join me in welcoming to the Distinctive Voices podium, Dr. Richard Foster. Thank you very much, Susan. Good evening. Thank you very much for coming out in the rain. There we go. It's great to see you all here tonight, and I'm going to take you through some thoughts that I've been developing over the past couple of decades, actually, on the concept of creativity. Many of us here are involved in or use creativity in our work. We're thought of as creative individuals. Our organizations are thought of as creative organizations, some more than others. And when we learned about creativity, at least when I learned about creativity, the things that I learned about didn't make any sense. Now, maybe some of you are Edward de Bono fans, so I'll be gentle. But I just don't understand how we're going to really push back the frontiers of physics by sitting around in a room over a weekend and thinking goofy thoughts with our friends. So I think there's more to it than that. And so I decided to pursue the question of where does this idea of creativity come from? I mean, my assumption was that it's as old as the mountains, but it turns out not to be the case. So I started on this quixotic voyage probably three decades ago now to try and pin down where does this notion come from, why is it significant, why is it so hard, do we have the right ideas about it now, do we not have the right ideas about it, and if we were really going to try and do something about it, what is it that we would do? So I'm going to try and answer a few of those questions for you tonight. If I've done this correctly, there will be something to offend almost everyone here. So please tell me what it is at the end. I don't need to hear it three or four times. A couple times would be fine, I think. So this history is, as I say, a selective history because we'd be here for quite a long time if I discussed it all. And it's a selective, largely Western history of the concept of creativity. And I'll tell you why it's largely Western near the end of it because I've looked a little bit at creativity as it's practiced and thought about in China and also in India, mainly through the Hindu religion. So that's what the concept is. So a long time ago, in a faraway place, Socrates decided to structure the way people were thinking. This is, by the way, after writing came about in his part of the world. Writing was probably the greatest innovation that we've ever had, and it completely changed the way we all think. Before writing, you couldn't make lists of more than seven or eight things or make them and remember them. And after writing, you could make lists of hundreds and thousands of things, and so you could combine them and you could think of new thoughts. So all this probably wouldn't have happened had writing not happened, but it did happen, and it happened in many places. And his student, Plato, carried on his great work, and his student, Aristotle, really started to put some stakes in the ground that have made a difference to us. So it was Aristotle, so far as I know, that put down the first rules of formal logic, demonstrated the power of deduction, and tried to apply all that to the study of natural science. So we're all Aristotelians here in the West. After Aristotle, there was a bit of a dry period for only about 2,000 years until Descartes came along and he formalized deduction. And then after that, David Hume came along and talked about induction, John Stuart Mill, maybe 80 years after this, and he went even more formally into deduction. So by the 17th and 18th century, we had all these things in place, and rhetoric was well established and ways of thinking were well established. But something was changing. It probably started to change in the 18th century, but it was pretty clear in the 19th century. De Maupassant wrote about creativity because there were enough things that had happened in science after the Enlightenment, and it was science that drove this. I think it's actually a combination of science and economics, or science and finance, I would say, which allowed businesses to be formed and economic growth to start, which had never really been the case up until the 18th century or so. And we experienced creativity in many places, certainly in music, 
Verdi was a very creative guy by himself, but he was stimulated to higher levels of creativity by Wagner when they had the big, big battles. Uh, and uh, depending on what side you come out on, you can tell me who won. Um, and then we went into really very modern music uh, by the end of the, uh, the, the 19th uh, uh, century. It's also true in science. Um, Cauchy developed uh, number theory uh, in the early uh, 19th uh, century. Uh, after that, uh, Darwin uh, made his contributions, uh, which we will hear more about uh, today, on evolution completely reversing the way people are thought uh, about God and man and, and still, still do. Uh, and then Maxwell uh, had uh, explained electromagnetism. So this was a period of enormous uh, discovery and creativity, and I'll come back to the difference uh, between those two words in, in a second. And then there was William James, uh, who laid out pragmatism, and we'll see that he plays a crucial role in all of this. So something was definitely happening in the 19th century that was different from the way uh, Aristotle uh, and, and his descendants had, had laid it out a couple of thousand years uh, before and we'll try to figure out what it was. I, I attribute the first uh, real uh, description of it to William James. Uh, by the way, the word creativity, none of you will believe this, but go, go home and check it and see. You can, if you can prove me wrong, that'd be great. But uh, the word creativity first appeared in Webster in 1875. <laughs> Create is a pre-14th century word. Uh, creative is about 16th century. Uh, but the, the ability of a person uh, to, uh, be, uh, to be described, uh, uh, to undertake the act of creativity was not really entered into Webster until 1875. And, short, and because of all the things I think we've been talking about, and shortly after that, William James, in 1896, in an address to the philosophical clubs in, of Yale and Brown, said in, uh, he was reflecting on, on Aristotle and uh, deduction and induction and quantitative deduction and all those things and said, you know, actually, instead of all that, instead of thoughts of concrete things patiently foul, following one another on a beaten track of habitual suggestion, I thought of nothing. <laughs> we have the most abrupt cross cuts and transitions uh, from one idea to another rarefied abstractions and discriminations, unheard of combinations of elements, the subtlest associations uh, of analogy. In a word, we seem suddenly introduced into a seething cauldron of ideas, where everything is fizzling and bobbling about in a state of bewildering activity, probably not words Aristotle would have chosen, where partnerships can be joined or loosened in an instant, treadmill routine is unknown, and the unexpected seems the only law. And this struck a chord uh, in the end of the 19th uh, century. And we can uh, see it in uh, Strindberg, for example. We can see it in many places. But in his uh, dream play of, of 1901, time and space do not exist. The imagination spins and weaves new patterns, a blending of memories, experiences, free inventions, absurdities, and improvisations. The characters are split, double, redouble, evaporate, condense, scatter, and converge. But one uh, consciousness remains uh, <coughs> the dreamers. For him, there are no secrets, no consequences, no scruples, no law. He does not judge, does not acquit. He simply relates. This ain't Aristotle. This is totally different. Uh, and so, as, as and oftentimes in science, when you make an observation that something is going on, then somebody has to start explaining why is that the case? What is going on here? And it was a pretty big question. So, and I will tell you well, at least uh, my, my history uh, of this today. And what we're going to do is I will define for you what I mean by creativity. I wouldn't suggest for a moment that you accept my definitions because you'll have your own. And we could probably argue about this for the next two weeks. Uh, and then I'll tell you, given that definition, I'll talk about the evolution of it, what the basic model is, what the elements of the model are, uh, and setting the context for creativity. And then I'll add in a few other problems uh, at, at the end. Hard problems, creativity in non-Western cultures, and uh, specific application. And I'll try to end up with a, a little checklist for you to see whether this view of creativity uh, concurs uh, with your own, and, and, and if not, where it might differ. So creativity. According uh, to Webster, uh, it's to produce insight through imaginative skill. I think that's a pretty good uh, definition. Uh, the two key words are insight uh, and imaginative skill. So uh, it's, it's something that we, we do. 
It is not the same as innovation. Creativity is producing new ideas, approaches, or actions, whereas innovation, in my book, is applying new ideas, approaches, or actions. So it's the difference between having the idea and applying the idea. Innovation is wildly important. We're all beneficiaries of it. We need more of it, not less of it. But it isn't the same as creativity. It is a downstream activity in this definition. Creativity is also different from discovery. Discovery means to make known or visible, to really uncover in some ways, and discover, uncover in some ways. It is often the handmaiden of creativity. We use a lot of creativity when we're looking into the universe. We use a lot of creativity when we're trying to find the boson and Higgs boson and all these kinds of things. But it is different because we are discovering something that hasn't been known as opposed to using our internal imaginative skill to find these things. So I think of it as different. And discovery and creativity are, however, often conflated. So you will hear that scientists make great discoveries, therefore they are creative. It's close but not exactly logical. It doesn't have to be that way necessarily. So these are two different words in my mind. Conventional, I'm going to now, let me contrast creativity and problem solving. Because what's the difference between creativity and problem solving? They both solve problems in some ways. So conventional problems are, the solution to conventional problems are very effective. And we're going to really explore this difference between creative problem solving and normal problem solving in the next hour here. Creative solutions, although according to many psychologists who have spent decades thinking about this, are characterized by several descriptors. First is they're insightful. That's good. I think that probably feels pretty normal. They are novel, new. Otherwise they wouldn't meet the creative test. They are simple. They're not complex. This is not Rube Goldberg. They're very elegant in their simplicity, often a way to tell the most creative ideas. And they're something else. They're generative. They not only solve the problem that's at hand, they suggest new problems which can be solved and also sometimes suggest the solution to those problems at the same time. That generativity to me is the single most important characteristic of creative solutions that makes them different from normal problem solutions. Normal problem solutions you can predict. Somebody asked me to design a heat exchanger. I can kind of do that. I can go to a bookshelf and I can pull it out and I know what I have to do and I know what I'm going to get and I will not be surprised by that heat exchanger unless it doesn't work. But in a creative solution, you are surprised by the power of it. The whole history of liquefaction of gases, for example, once they had a big breakthrough and found out that pressure was related and the release of pressure could cool a gas, then boom, then all of a sudden you could do nitrogen, you could do oxygen, you could do hydrogen and eventually helium. So generative ideas. So in terms of what's actually going on, I'm going to describe to you what I think is the best description to this day of the creative process and it's the Wallace cycle. But I'll start a little bit before him with Herman von Helmholtz, who to the best of my knowledge is the first person to really reflect on their own creativity. This is kind of like physicians operating on themselves or taking their own drugs or something like that. And he sat back and he said, what did I do when I had a creative idea? And he tried to write those elements down and he came pretty close to it and he had several elements which I will describe to you. He wasn't the only one. Poincaré did a similar exercise and came up with similar insights. So there was beginning to be a sense that there were some common characteristics of creative solutions. And then out of no place came this Scotsman, Graham Wallace, who was a Fabian, who the Fabians were the precursors of the Labour Party in Britain. And he was probably a communist leaner in the beginning and then like many other people during this generation, backed off from communism and he ended up on the socialism side. But he thought about this a lot and after him, another physicist, Jacques Hanavard from France, also began to reflect on these things. All three of these things, von Helmholtz, Wallace and Hanavard, more or less said the same thing. I think it more or less stands today, but Wallace was the one who has written the most elegant book on this, written in 1926, which you're 
If you're interested, you can get on Amazon for only about 3,500 bucks these days. Uh, he, he said uh, that uh, the, the creative process begins uh, with uh, a stage of preparation, and, that pre and we'll talk about each of these stages in some depth, but it can, it, it can last for a very long period of time. Then goes into incubation, which he called a black, dark period. He had no idea what went on in, in there because it was after you had prepared, then nothing happened for a really long time. Uh, and then all of a sudden, uh, you had illumination or that flash uh, of insight and, and uh, genius. And that came in, in fractions of a second. Uh, and when it came and why it came, when it came, he couldn't figure out. After that, you have validation uh, of it, uh, verification that the idea really has some sort of merit. Th uh, then, you, then you verify that, that it works uh, beyond uh, a reasonable doubt, and then you, you put it into use. The, the first three stages are the ones that are really characteristic, which differentiate creative problem solving from problem solving. You don't need to do those first three stages in conventional uh, problem solving. And Wallace saw these, these stages as being a very interleaved and, and interwoven. So yes, there's preparation and incubation and illumination and validation and verification. Just as you're about to get it there, you have to start all over again because the whole thing falls apart. And so you go to preparation. Incub oh, back, back to preparation again, and then forward uh, to incubation and illumination and back to incubation. And so there is no logical sequence here. Uh, and all of you who have been involved in this will understand that. Uh, and those of you who want to be involved in this should anticipate uh, this. Uh, have, uh, have, have, uh, how many of you have read Elizabeth Kubler-Roth's uh, On Death and Dying and her five phases of uh, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance? And it's the same thing with those. That, those are five stages. We can remember them. We know what they are, but they don't follow in that sequence. You can go back and forth. This is exactly the same uh, as, as that. So uh, now to talk about some of the elements of the model. So we're going to take these six steps. I'm only going to really talk about three of them. And if, if you fall asleep or, or whatever, in the upper right-hand side, there's that little colored diagram there, and it'll tell you where we are. And then when you wake up, <laughs> you'll, you'll know what you've missed. Uh, so uh, in, in the preparation stage, there's a variety of things uh, that uh, one, one can do, and I'll talk about each of them uh, in a little bit of uh, depth. First of all is conducting a broad search, very broad search. That means outside uh, your own area of expertise. Explore things through direct experience. Reading about things is fine, but doing them is, is, is much better. Searching the periphery uh, of, of your area. So if you're in business and you have small competitors, knowing who, who they are and what they do and why they're, they're doing it, and also know who their competitors are, the competitors of your small competitors. That's really on the periphery. We'll talk a little bit about that. Seek emergent dominant uh, designs, and I'll tell you what I mean by that, but, but all experiments that are successful don't become successful in the long term because they're not the dominant way, the best way of, of doing that, so we can, we can discover things multiple times. We seek anomalies and par uh, paradoxes and, and many other uh, form of conundra, and, and we'll see why, because in those, uh, the resolution of those can often uh, result in, in the act of creation. Uh, and give others permission to search as opposed to shutting them down. So this is very much a control versus permission uh, thing. If any of you want to talk about Wall Street in this regard, we can do that afterwards. So uh, the, uh, how many of you know how to pronounce this guy's name? <laughs> ah, that's good. That's more, than, that's more than normal. Well, don't tell if I don't do it right. Uh, so uh, uh, Mihaly, or, or Mike, as he's called, uh, Chick Mahai, uh, was the, uh, eventually the chairman of the uh, psychology department at the University of Chicago. And uh, he's uh, written a lot on creativity. We'll, we'll see him uh, uh, again. Uh, but he said that the creative process starts, and that's what we're trying to do now, talk about it, starts with a sense that there is a puzzle someplace or a task to be accomplished. That's different from saying that there's a problem to be solved. It's a puzzle uh, to be investigated. Uh, or, you know, when they, when they originally uh, did the, the work on liquefaction of gases, uh, the, uh, the I, I, I think it was, I'm not sure, maybe it was Faraday, but one of the early guys uh, figured out uh, that it was possible to extrapolate uh, where absolute zero should be. They were, they were hundreds of degrees away, but he was able to figure out from knowing a few points, he was able to backcast to, to where it would be absolute zero. Once that concept of absolute zero uh, became 
wow, look at that. Then, then it was a puzzle to be solved. What, what is it? What does it mean? How can we get to it? And only 100 years later, they figured it out. Perhaps something is uh, not right. Somewhere there's a conflict, a tension, a need to be satisfied. By the way, all this implies that we should be extremely sensitive to these things because these are little whispers. They're, they're not loud. It's not loud banging at the door. They're little whispers. And you have to become very good at listening to these little whispers. Often they come at night. And we'll talk about uh, when they come at night uh, a little bit later on. The, problem is, uh, the problematic issues can be triggered by a personal experience, by a lack of fit in the symbolic system, by a stimulation of the colleagues, uh, or by public needs. So it can come from uh, any place. Having general rules is, is uh, uh, some, some concise rules is not very practical. Without such a felt tension to attract the psychic energy of the person, the creative process is unlikely uh, to start. And I, I believe that's correct uh, today. So how do you actually do this? Well, I've, I've been fortunate enough to spend some time with a couple of guys that were pretty good at this, uh, Joshua Letterberg and Murray Gilman. And when I, when I had the opportunity, when they were trapped in a car with me or something, uh, I, would, I would say, now, I don't want to talk about the significance uh, of your work, and uh, I want to talk about why did you pick the problems you picked to work on? How did you figure that out? Uh, and much to my surprise, even though one's a biologist and the other's a physicist, uh, they both said basically the same thing. And here's what they said. First of all, you read everything. You can get your hands on it. Uh, they also would include in this talking to everybody they can, they can talk to. Uh, then, then you eliminate everything that makes sense. They don't eliminate all those people that didn't make sense, but they eliminated everything that made sense. And you save all the rest. And then you reread that stuff that doesn't make any sense and toss out the ones that where it doesn't make any sense because there was an obvious error in experimental method or they were sloppy or they didn't know something that sh should have known. And then what you've got uh, is a stack of things that uh, are really interesting and that don't make any sense and that people haven't figured out. And then you pick the, uh, the, the ones out of uh, that pile that seem important to you, not necessarily to the world because you can't tell if they're going to be important to the world, but important to you and solvable. That's the other part of it. They have to, you have to have a way to start. You have to have a way into it. Uh, figuring out uh, what the uh, surface uh, of Uranus is going to look like is very interesting, but most of us wouldn't have a way of doing that. So we wouldn't prioritize that, and neither, neither, neither would they. Uh, so th this is their method. I think it's a rather good method, uh, actually. Now, you have to figure out how to use it in your own particular circumstance, and that can require a lot of creativity in and of itself. But that's a pretty straightforward method, and the more people I've talked to in science, the more uh, they, they think that's pretty good. Another thing is to use a muse uh, to stimulate the subconscious. Uh, the muses uh, were unmarried, uh, uh, but mothers, uh, unmarried women, but mothers of famous uh, sons, like Orpheus, uh, for, for example. There were nine of them, including Polymathia, uh, much learning, uh, and Memnosine, uh, standing for memory. We, we remember those two. Interestingly, they were common in uh, Indian, Greek, and Roman cultures. I don't know about uh, uh, Chinese cultures. I have not heard of it in China, but that, doesn't, that probably reflects more of me than anything else. Um, and today, of course, it's a very common uh, root word for music museum and, and so forth. Th these muses have been incredibly important uh, in science uh, over the years. Uh, Einstein's student and friend uh, from the Berne Patent Office, Michael Besso, was his muse. And he, he not only uh, was kind of a reader of all Einstein's papers and a stimulator of, of Einstein, and the only person in some ways that Einstein trusted, uh, but he also introduced Einstein to famous people at the time, like Ernst Mach and, and so forth. Uh, so a muse is very important. Uh, we all can have muses. Uh, they can be friends. They can be enemies. Uh, you can't tell whether which one is best necessarily. But it's something if you uh, want to get in this business, you should think about somebody that you can talk to your ideas about without talking to a, a huge crowd and before you write something. Uh, and then there's the periphery, thinking about the periphery, right, writing on the edge of, of things because a lot of interesting phenomena happen there. In the, in the world of business, in the world of pharmaceuticals, this chart I drew about 10 years ago, so forgive me, but you can think of the, you can think of the core pharmaceutical industry uh, at the time with J&J &J and Glaxo and Bristol-Myers and so forth. And there were a whole bunch of companies that got, had gone out of business by that time, mainly through merger and acquisition, not through bankruptcy. But around the edge of this, 10 or 15 years ago, were Genzyme, Chiron, Genentech, Allergan. We know all those names now, but we didn't know them in the early 90s, I guarantee you. 
Nobody, most of the guys in the large pharma industry couldn't tell you what they were doing. And that was a big mistake. Uh, that you should know what's going on at, at the periphery. So for me, in industry, this is a periphery. Every field has its own periphery. Uh, so uh, know that, uh, figure out what that is, and use, it, use direct experience. Another thing is the search for the dominant design. This is a picture of the Gutenberg Press. Uh, and every, you know, this was the, uh, the, the signal moment in, in Western history where we could replicate uh, what we knew. But it wasn't the first press. It wasn't even close to the first press. William Cacton had been printing things uh, 100 years before. But this was an automatic press. So it's, it wasn't the idea of printing that came out. It was the idea of how to print quickly. Dominant, that's the notion of the dominant design. And we have had other dominant designs. Here's one that nobody here remembers, including me, uh, other than saying it on Fourth of July parades. But it, it became the thing that in, in 1906 or so, there were 600 automobile companies in the world, all producing with a different thing. All the engine in the front, engine in the back, four wheels, five wheels, wheels, three wheels, windscreen, no windscreen, boot, no boot, all these. Then these, all of a sudden the Model T came along, boom, that, that was it. That was the dominant design. Here's another one. Uh, and and uh, we, we will see whether we have another dominant design emerging uh, we, that was introduced uh, roughly April 2nd. Uh, so, and, and, but it's not clear. Uh, but so it's, it's not necessarily the first innovation or the first idea. It's the, it's the configuration of that in a way that works. Um, and you, you, we, we think of, of Dewar, uh, who was the first to liquefy hydrogen, and he thought this was going to be the one that got him uh, the, the leadership of the world scientific uh, community. But along the way, technology had advanced, so Camerlionis was able to liquefy helium, which he did uh, shortly thereafter, and, and Camerlionis got all the credit, and Dewar got very little. So uh, this is a difficult to think about, but it's an important concept uh, to think about when we're thinking about creativity. We're, we're after the dominant design. Another one, when the motion picture camera was invented, uh, many early filmmakers simply uh, recorded st uh, stage plates. They took what they knew how to do and just recorded it in stage plates, as if the camera's value was to just preserve the theatrical performance and enlarge its audience. But the true pioneers realized that the camera freed them from the confines of the theater. So they had to go outside. They had to go to their own periphery, maybe even beyond their own periphery, and experiment with what this, this might be, not knowing what it uh, might be. But I can tell you it was generative. It was, uh, it was simple, novel, elegant, but it was also very generative. To tell stories with pictures and then with sound, directors developed a whole new language using lighting and cameras and angles, close-ups and panoramas. All of you that have been in big science or close to big science can identify with this because that's exactly what one does in, in big science. You invent the instrument to allow you uh, to do it. In short, the motion picture camera was an entirely new to tool for storytelling. Now, storytelling is a big deal because that's the way most of us communicate in, in the world is through telling stories uh, of, of one kind uh, uh, or another. So uh, these, these things uh, happen uh, in, in many uh, strange and wonderful uh, ways. So that's, that's uh, preparation. Incubation is this uh, mysterious dark phase that... Uh, that uh, couldn't be understood, at least uh, by von Helmholtz and Poincaré and, and Wallace and, and uh, even Hadamard to some extent. But we know more about it uh, today uh, because of what we know about psychology and what we know about neurology and neuroscience uh, and even fMRI is uh, getting into the uh, game these days. Uh, and I'll talk about some aspects of it. One is uh, a style of thinking which chess masters call zoom in, zoom out thinking. How many of you know about zoom in, zoom out thinking? Okay, so we'll cover that. Uh, uh, slow down in business. Everybody knows. Oh, we got to go faster. We got to go faster. This is about slowing down. This is the anti-go faster uh, solution. Uh, here uh, is about finding the missing elements. It's not only about what's there; it's what's missing. Um, it's about identifying anomalies and, and paradoxes, and it's about stimulating the subconscious in a conscious way, uh, which which we can do. There have been a couple of great contributions uh, to uh, decoding what goes on in this incubation period. One of them was Jacob Getzels, uh, again, at the uh, at University of Chicago, and in fact a teacher uh, of uh, Chick Mahais. And he made the observation, uh, which I think is uh, quite profound, that there's a big difference between uh, presented problems, uh, 54 factorial equals what, right, uh, and discovering problems. And when a big part of creativity is discovering problems and discovering the right problem and recognizing when one has discovered that problem. So presented problems, problem solving lasts for hours or days, depending on how hard it is. 
It's solved by the retrieval of information previously stored. Um, and it's a pretty rapid uh, retrieval of information, and it gets faster and faster as we get better and better at it. Whereas discovered problems, which I would associate with creative problem solving, there's a general sense of unease, as, as uh, Chick Mahai uh, said. Uh, the initial problem formulation is uh, more often than not re rejected and said, no, that's not the problem at all. You've got to restate uh, what, what the problem is. Simultaneous problem specification and solution discovery often occur. You don't even know what the problem is until you have a solution uh, standing uh, right in front of you. And discovery can last for an unpredictable amount of time, including years. So when, when you see all these, and, and most of the uh, really uh, great creative acts, at least uh, that, that I have uh, seen, and there are people, uh, uh, Dean Keith Simonton is the best that I know, uh, historiographer, and he's studied 3,000 case studies of creative people. I mean, it's not 12, it's 3,000. Uh, and these generalizations uh, hold uh, in, in those. In the, the most imp the significant, uh, significant discoveries and, and creations occur in the second group, not, not in the first group. Uh, so it's very different from taking a weekend and sitting with your clever friends and talking about how to solve nuclear nonproliferation or something. It, it, it just doesn't happen like that. Those tend to be sustaining innovations, which is fine. We all ought to do it. Very important, big part of life, um, and probably equal an economic importance to the really uh, breakthrough discoveries, but we have to have those uh, as well. So it's a, the problem finding and problem solving are two different neurological processes, and we know that now. We know, we know it from the fMRI studies and, and all that. Those studies are just getting going, uh, but there's a wonderful professor in uh, Columbia uh, College of Physicians and Surgeons named Joy Hirsch. I don't know if any of you are fMRI people, but she, she takes pictures of the brain while you're thinking things, and she can start unpacking some of these, and uh, it's, it's pretty interesting. Um, so as uh, one of my favorite uh, writers, uh, G.K. Chesterton, said, it isn't that they can't see the solution, it's that they can't see the problem. And that's, that's what we have to, we have to uh, focus on uh, first. Another great contribution was made by J.P. Guilford, uh, who was uh, in charge of uh, testing intelligence in the Army uh, during the Second World War and shortly thereafter, and probably made the greatest contribution to the standardization of, of abilities. Uh, these, this isn't to get you into college. This is to be sure that you're capable of fighting in a war. Uh, so these are really important uh, things that he was very serious about. And he did his work up pretty close to here. I think it might have been in San Diego. Um, and he, he talked about divergent thinking, which is multiple solutions and which he associates uh, with creativity, and convergent thinking, which is rule problem or uh, rule following or, or problem solving. This this is this is different than problem finding and, and problem uh, problem solving and problem finding. Uh, it's kind of orthogonal to it. It's but it's about how you think. Do you expand expansively, or do you think uh, re reductively? Uh, and so. The, the image that came to my mind is the Ames uh, Powers of Ten movie, which I'm sure you've all, all seen. Uh, so you'll remember it started with a couple on a blanket uh, some someplace, uh, and you zoomed in uh, on their hands, and then you zoomed in on the cells in their hands, and then you zoomed in on the molecules, and blah, blah, blah. So that's zoom-in uh, thinking, what the chess masters would call zoom-in thinking. It's convergent thinking. It's analytic genius. It's deductive. You really have to be very good uh, to do that. Uh, and then there's zoom out thinking, where you say you put the context around this couple on a blanket. Where, where is the blanket? It's in a park. Where is the park? It's on the earth. Where is the earth? It's in the Milky Way. Blah blah blah. Uh, and that's divergent uh, thinking or zoom out uh, thinking. Changes in problem definition or context. It's inductive and it requires enormous conceptual fluency at each of these levels and at the linkages between these levels. So you've got to be able to connect the scales uh, here to do this sort of thinking. And that, that almost uh, implies being uh, having an interdisciplinary uh, orientation. And you've got to be able to do, connect those scales rapidly. So I, uh, I, one of my best days was the day I spent with uh, Bill Gates and a group of two or three others. Gates was absolutely amazing. I mean, he could talk about the details of the German banking system, and two seconds later he'd be talking about some computer code. And to him it was all part of the same thing. I mean, he had the most amazing mental map of the world and how everything fit together that, that I've ever seen. Uh, so you've got to be able to play these scales and, and play them uh, very rapidly. Effective solutions uh, to problems generally work at all scales and, and between the scales. So 
So it's, it's a complex problem. And it's, uh, you know, we've spent a lot of time in science in the last 10 years or 20 years talking about the difference between uh, uh, reductive uh, thinking and systems uh, thinking. So fractal geometry and complex adaptive systems and all these other kinds of things. And you may or may not believe in those things, but, but one is attempting to zoom out and the other is attempting to zoom in. It's also in this dark space uh, of incubation. It's about slowing down as opposed to speeding up, suspending disbelief for hours, days, or months to allow for selective rearrangements of the mental elements that you have, and we'll come back to those uh, in a second. Uh, delayed commitment to hypothesis formation, waiting periods, um, and manipulating data. In, instead of saying, yes, that's a good idea, you say, hmm, and hmm, interesting, interesting. And I'm sure all of you know people who are very wise and get quite far by saying, hmm. <laughs> um, uh, you, ha you have to learn to listen uh, for, the, uh, for, for the silence. Uh, so how many of you know the Sherlock uh, uh, Holmes story, the dog that didn't bark? Is it? Raise hands. Okay, so there's enough that I'll tell the story for those of that. Uh, so uh, there was a horse on the night before the great race, and this was the horse that was supposed to win the race. And the horse was murdered uh, on that night. And the question was, who done it? Uh, and this was uh, very hard because there were no witnesses. And so Sherlock was called in to do it. And, um, and Sherlock starts uh, his investigation by saying, is there any point to which you would wish to draw my attention? And, uh, and one of the people there says, to the curious incident of the dog in the nighttime. And they said, and so the, the dog did nothing at the nighttime. The dog did nothing at nighttime. That was the curious incident, remarked Sherlock, uh, Sherlock Holmes. The only person uh, at whom the stable dog would not bark uh, warnings was the dog's owner. Uh, hence, the dog's uh, silence indicated that the only one who could have uh, endured the whole uh, killing of the horse was the dog's owner, and he solved the case, and so we all bought the book. So uh, what he was what he was uh, uh, listening for was the noise that's not there, and and all of us in, in science uh, do do that. There's also finding anomalies. I don't know whether in this picture you can see a couple of different pictures uh, or not. Uh, you probably see some uh, monks or priests or or, uh, or men of the cloth at least, and you also see an old man uh, there. And so, you know, which is it? Uh, well, it, it, it may be a little bit of both. Ambiguities are things capable of multiple interpretations. We have to deal with those in science. And often they're the source of creative solutions. Illusions, distortions of the senses, and we'll come back to that uh, at, at the end, which are very uh, important. And how to know what you're looking at is really what you're, you're looking at. Paradoxes, uh, this sentence is false. So what do I do with that? Um, and, and you see that all the time in science. Dilemmas or, or double propositions. Riddles and puzzles, questions uh, with double or veiled uh, meanings. Conundrums, logical uh, postulations uh, that evade uh, resolutions. And enigmas, m um, mysterious puzzles. There's a lot of these things. And instead of rejecting them as the pragmatic uh, businessman who has to operate and turn out widgets every day at a particular cost and quality levels, they, they want to get rid of those. On the creative side, you want to harbor those. You want to... You want to collect those uh, kinds of things and fallacies, conclusions based on, on poor reasoning. So, you know, this double vision can be quite stunning sometimes. And uh, this is one I saw in Paris a couple of years ago I rather liked, so I, I picked it up. So that's, that's what goes on in this dark A lot goes on in this dark space, and there's a lot we can actually do to encourage that and to listen to the small voices and to listen for what's, what's not there. The illumination... Uh, is uh, now we know more about that too. It's uh, the active by association. I'll tell you what that means in a second. Social interactions to stimulate these things by managing conversations, manage the context, the time, and agendas uh, of the conversations you're going to have, managing people, juxtaposing perspectives, uh, and then personal habits like sleep, which we'll also talk about. So this guy, Arthur Kessler, uh, was a famous uh, novelist, and he was another one in some ways like von Helmholtz uh, and Wallace and uh, that uh, reflected on his own creativity. And he, he wrote a book in 1963 called The Act of Creation, which if there's one book on creativity I'd recommend to you, it's that one. And he talks about science, art, and humor. And he thinks they're all the same thing, basically. And, and what, uh, what he uh, said was that the act of creation uh, is the bisociation, since he didn't know an English word uh, that, that made sense, he made one up, 
of one field of knowledge, call it physics, with another field of knowledge, call it cybernetics or something. And at the intersection between those two is where you find the insights, the juxtapositioning of those two fields. The Xerox machine was a great invention, but it was Joe Wilson's invention of a way to finance it that really made the difference and made Xerox into a successful company. No relationship between the physics of selenium and finance, but it was that juxtaposition that made the product possible. Schumpeter, this handsome man down here who I think is so smart that I've copied his forehead, talked about de neue Kombination and the new combination of things. And that's basically at its root, whether in this culture or any others, it is about the combination of things that already exist. And then you get more combinations after you get the first combination. So this act of juxtapositioning and by association is quite important. So actually in the 60s, all these guys made their observations in the 60s. So the 60s was an explosive time. Nothing happened basically to the theory of creativity from Wallace to the mid 60s. And then boom, we had this flood of guys, most of which has been lost in the literature. There was another view that came from Donald Campbell, and I won't spend any real time on it, which combined a little bit of evolution and psycho-cybernetics, which was very popular at the time. He was also in the 60s, very distinguished guy, president of the American Psychological Association for a while. And he thought of creativity more or less in a Darwinian way, blind variation plus selective retention. He had some key ideas, knowledge developed by trial and error. Both the individual and the group are necessary. It was a two-step process. First of all, you initiate blind variation, almost at random, he would argue, and then you pick the best variations by some stable criteria that we're using, then you start the whole thing all over again. I'm not going to spend any time on that. I don't think it's as fundamental as the ones that we've been talking about. Useful, interesting analogy. Some people, you'll hear it talked about sometimes. So if you pick up the Kessler notion of by association, it's a little bit like doing anagrams. And anagrams is not about combinations. It's about permutations. And that makes a big difference mathematically. Because combinations go, according to the number of elements, n to the n minus 1, and permutations go n to the n. That's a lot more. So it makes a difference whether, if you have three letters, like OGD, for example, whether you organize them as dog or god. I mean, those are not the same. And you can only determine which is the right one from the context. It has nothing to do with the letters. It's zooming out. You have to see it in context to know what that's the answer to. So I have one for you to illustrate this. To its vivid science. Who knows? The anagram. Okay, so I'll make it a little simpler. Who knows how long it's going to take you to figure out what the anagram is? Who knows how to plan how long it's going to take you to figure out? Gee, I'm amazed. This is what we face in science all the time. Somebody comes in and says, when can you have it done? Have what done? Right? I mean, I don't know what I'm looking for. Right? So, oh, you're the scientist. You know. So it's just an inappropriate thing to do. This one happens to mean distinctive voices, which is the seminar that you're at right now. Right. So, again, it wasn't the combination. It was the combination and the context that makes sense here. This is Dean Keith Simonton that I told you about before that's looked at 3,000 different creative people. And his conclusions include the fact that insight occurs when the problem has been restructured or clarified. It's not that the elements are necessarily true. It's OGD or is it DOG or is it GOD? I mean, that's the restructuring of the problem. Most individuals describe not a single moment of insight, but a complex multistage process with frequent interpersonal contacts, thinking through options while maintaining awareness of what questions were interesting. So you have to keep a couple things in mind at the same time, and you've got to keep doing it, keep doing it, keep doing it. And then you'll eventually get there. My friend Josie Schlesinger at Yale, who is one of the most productive medicinal chemists in the United States, has said it takes him 14 years to crystallize an idea, three weeks to analyze it, and three seconds to come up with a way to get it done. And so, you know, this is this long incubation and preparation time and then the flash that you get. 
You can you can carry out. So I've been more or less talking about individuals. You can carry out this in a in a accelerated way, catalyzed way through conversation. So you all remember multimedia in the mid mid 90s. And if you ask Bill Gates what he meant by multimedia in 1990, he would give you a coherent view that was based around software. If you ask Michael Eisner at the time at Disney what what multimedia meant, he had his definition, which had virtually nothing, which was also internally consistent, which had nothing to do with what Bill Gates was talking about. But but it was multimedia and it was it was correct. If you took Bob Allen, who was chairman of AT&T at the time and ask him what multimedia meant, you couldn't have told the other two guys were even in the same solar system. So these and this is what these problems are like. You get these different points of view. And how do you get them together? You put them together and you talk and you talk in relaxed ways. You can try to structure these if you want. But more often this happens at breakfast or dinner or at the blackboard someplace than than it does in any structured way. You just have to take time. It's like doing those 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 anagrams. And you could have added a few more to that that list to complicate the decision. Then there's sleep. Who knows what these words mean? But I was beginning to think there are some ringers in the audience here. So these are these are the two states of changing from being awake to being asleep. And hypnagogic is when you're going to sleep at night. And Dolly was famous for doing this. He would. This story goes. I don't believe the story, but it's an amusing story. Anyway, he would sit and drink brandy after after dinner. And then he put his chin on a spoon and wait for slumber to come. And when slumber came, his head would move. The spoon would fall, make a noise. He'd wake up and paint his pictures. And so that's how he was able to do it. Hypnopompic, which is what I am, is waking up at four o'clock in the morning. So I've got it. I figured it out. And then I try to write it down. And then then I go back to sleep and I sleep like a rock. And I get up and I read what I've put down, except I can't read it because I wrote it too fast and I was too anxious to go back to bed. And then the four percent of the time I can actually read it. It makes no sense to me at all. And but the one percent of those things, it's actually a pretty good idea. And if you live long enough, you can accumulate some of these things. So these are two good cocktail party words. You can use them with your friends. But but there's a serious point to it that these are very important moments. In the one case, you're going from an unstructured or you're going from a structured world being awake to an unstructured world. And that's where the artists generally get their insight. The other is you're going from an unstructured world, otherwise known as dreaming, to a structured world, otherwise known as waking up. And that's when scientists tend to get they see how things that they are aware of how they fit together. There's increasing amounts of research on sleep and the effect of the impact of sleep on problem solving. It's very dramatic. We don't have time to talk about it tonight. But don't waste your sleep time. Take a little pad of paper, put it next to your bed, get another spouse, whatever you have to do to write these things down. Take a little nightlight, go to the gym, whatever, where you can write them down and then come back and go to sleep. And you'll find it's amazingly productive. So what did Simonton have to say about all this? He said the capacity for chance configurations, which is these anagrams, accelerates with the size of the repertoire of mental elements. So the more things we know about, the more likely it is we're going to find a chance configuration. And so get a lot of these things over time. That's part of the process of preparation. It appears these mechanisms are always operating in the background, much like the operating system of a computer. That's an incredibly important point. But what Simonton is saying here is if you focus on it, it's not going to happen for you. So just don't do that. This is a matter of peripheral vision. So you've got to use these these night experiences. You've got to use hypnagogy and hypnopompy and all those kinds of things if you really want to make this thing work. And by the way, in corporations that have these big crushes, we're going to be innovative. So we're going to have a task force in three months and we're going to be innovative. You know, that has no more chance than the three guys sitting on a beanbag over the weekend. As far as I'm concerned, this operates in the background. That's actually the good news, because corporations, you can get this for free. You just have to get people that are willing to spend the time operating in the background. And Simonton's actually developed a whole bunch of models about how these these patterns of bringing these these chance configurations together work with career age, which is the abscissa that you see here. So poets look like this. Starts off at a very low level, raises very fast and maximum. It's a peak at 25 years of that's career life. So you're you know, you've had a pretty good shot. And then then starts downhill. But note at 60 years, 
of career life, which is a really good shot, you're still more productive than you were at 10 years of career life. I find that incredibly encouraging. So, <laughs> uh, so there, you know, it's kind of good news, bad news. Historians, it's a different curve because it's more complex. Uh, finding some of these these mental images in uh, uh, international political affairs may, uh, or international finance may be more complex uh, than that. And he says that youth favors fluid intelligence, mathematics, poetry, chemistry, physics, biology, uh, clear rules, demands, quick to change, uh, and so those will be faster curves. Uh, but age favors crystallized, what he called crystallized intelligence, humanities, less clear rules, demands to take years to change, and all that sort of stuff. Uh, and I like that idea a lot. Um, <laughs> So, you know, there are some people, uh, you know, the idea that you know, if you're past 35, you're completely finished. Um, and I, I don't believe that. Uh, so, you know, Ben Franklin did bifocals at the age of, of 78. Verdi did Falstaff at 80 after being attacked by, by Wagner for some years. Michelangelo did the uh, Pauline Chapel frescoes at 89. Not, not bad. He was painting them himself. And Frank Lloyd Wright finished the Guggenheim at 91. So let's hear it for those guys. I, you know, uh, <laughs> It's, uh, it's, it's uh, far, far from over, far from over. Don't let them sell you anything else. Um, and Simonton himself, it turns out, it's, uh, this, is, this has no particular point, but I kind of like it, so I put it in here. Uh, he made a dedication to a guy named David Kenny, and, he, and David Kenny earned his PhD under Donald T. Campbell, that guy that I told you about that had the Darwinian uh, theory. And Campbell did his PhD under Robert Tryon, who did his PhD under Edward Tolman, who did his PhD under Edwin Holt, who did his PhD under William James. So the circle, uh, the circle is uh, squared uh, here. And whose name, and Ken, Kenny, uh, whose name was given to the Harvard Psychology Building, where Simonton uh, earned his uh, PhD. So there you are. I mean, it is a, a tight uh, little, little circle, actually. So who does this creative stuff? Anybody? Well, not anybody. It turns out there's quite a bit. Uh, there's some unusual characteristics. They have people that do this well, have a, this bi-associative ability. Uh, they tend to be multidisciplinary. They tend to be interested in multiple things. Uh, as you know, Malcolm Gladwell has his constant of 10,000 hours. You need 10,000 hours to be an excellent uh, expert in anything. If you live long enough, you can accumulate several of those things, actually. Uh, and it takes about five years, if I've done that math right. Uh, and you can start seeing the intersections between things. So if you if you spend your whole life uh, in one of them, you're not going to see the intersections, obviously. If you do multiple fields, you'll see many intersections. So that's a good thing to do. So that's the bi-associative ability. Curiosity is certainly uh, there. It's uh, And that also, uh, by the way, correlates with long life and, and good health. Uh, love for ambiguity. As a, uh, a really uh, serious, focused businessman hate ambiguity, but, but the creative types love it. Uh, sunny pessimism, as Chick Mahai has, has uh, called it, which is a rather nice phrase, I think. And a, a, a certain immaturity. I don't know whether any of you have ever known anybody like this. Um, I personally haven't, but I can imagine that it's true. Um, energy and productivity. These people do not lollygag around. Uh, I don't know how many p paintings Van Gogh painted, but it was in the thousands. We know hundreds. But it was in the thousands. And if you do thousands, you can have a hundred that are pretty good. You know, so um, ability to sustain concentrated attention. They're incredibly focused when they're focused. Uh, so Camelianus, when he was doing his, his helium, uh, and on the day of his experiment, his wife came over and fed him while he was working the apparatus. Uh, so he was really focused. Um, they are characterized by great passion. They tend to be rather open because this is the way they get these chance configurations. They have both humility and pride, which is we'll see they often have opposite characteristics. They're quite, they're quite impatient. They're risk-seeking. Um, they have, uh, I, I quickly point out, this is not original research I have done. I'm reporting what others have said. They're psychologically androgynous. Um, they're aggressive uh, yet nurturing. They're sensitive uh, yet rigid. Uh, they're dominant yet submissive. Um, <laughs> They're extroverted and introverted. Uh, they have a sense of us. Not my research. I'm just reporting on what others have said. And uh, as somebody said, damn it, all Saul Quarter, you always have to do things differently from the way other people do it. In other words, these people are really hard to manage. Uh, so um, let's see here. So then you have to get on to real life. Now you have the fun part. You've had the preparation, the incubation, the, the illumination. Now, now you've got to get down to business and make something happen. Everyone agrees uh, that as necessary as it is to listen to the unconscious is not sufficient. 
The real work begins when the emotion or the idea that sprung from the uncharted regions of the psyche are held up to the light of reason. Oh, that stuff again. Back to Aristotle. There to be named, classified, and puzzled over. Very important words. Named, classified, and puzzled over. Naming and classifying are two of the most important issues in science, I think, and related to other emotions and ideas. It is here that the craft comes into play. The writer draws on a huge repertoire of words, expressions, and images used by previous writers, selects the ones most fitting to the present task, and knows how to make up new ones when needed. So that's a lot of the real work, and that can be fun, too, if you've gone through this. So setting the context. Everything we've talked about, more or less everything we've talked about in the wall of cycles so far, has been focused, which is a very iterative process, as we talked about. It's very fast, as we talked about. And it shuffles between hope and despair. But all that's been about the individual. But there's, let me ask you another question. Who designed Brunelleschi's dome? This is one of the chipmunk eyes. This is harder than Grant's tomb. This is harder than Grant's tomb. So, and I just walked up to the top of this two weeks ago. I was very pleased with myself. And so chipmunk eyes answer was, nor can one say that it's the creative person who starts the creative process. In reality, they were only catalysts for a much more complex process with many participants and inputs. So, yes, Brunelleschi was there. He was the overall architect. But he surely worked with many designers. And he surely was coming from a grand tradition that went thousands of years before him. And, in fact, the dome is built on a principle called a sprung arch. Anybody know what a sprung arch is? So you build a wooden frame, and then you put the bricks over the top of it, and then you take the frame out and run like hell and hope that it doesn't fall down, right? And the sprung arch actually was first invented by potters because that's where they could keep the heat in there. And it was probably preceded, you know, a thousand years before Brunelleschi. So these things all have a long, long history. So Brunelleschi was a part of the team that designed Brunelleschi's dome, but he wasn't the guy. So it's about the social context. And the social context is about these conversations. It's about the person who generates the variation, but it's also about the domain, what we know and what we retain and what's part of our field. And it's also about the field. And the field are the gatekeepers. They are the editors of the journals. They are the initiators of the journals. They are the deans of departments. They are the admissions committees. They are all these. And these are incredibly important because these folks don't change and don't admit new folks. At the same time that they're maintaining standards, nothing happens. You don't get the change. So this is an incredibly important element of this whole thing. So we've come a long way from everything is fizzling and bobbling and about in a state of bewildering activity, as James said. But hopefully I've given you a little bit of understanding of why the creative process, as it's really practiced, is quite different from the highly simplified and dysfunctional images that we generally have in society as it's portrayed sometimes in publications that I've never read. So I can't tell you what they are. There are some hard problems that are left. Simonton talks about barriers. Misleading cues cause excessive initial fixation on ineffective solution. I don't know whether any of you have been there. I have certainly been there. Memory channels block the formation of new channels of information. So you know something so well you can't learn anything else. And then there's this whole business of deception. This is my instruction manual for how to move a tank. You just pick it up and move it. And, of course, this was an inflatable tank that was used in D-Day invasion in World War II to throw the Nazis off. And to pick up from Machiavelli, he said, although the use of fraud in any action is detestable, yet in the combat of war it is praiseworthy and glorious. So, you know, this is straight from Tuscany. There's also self-deception. There are two different points of view represented in this picture. And maybe you can see what they are. And so the act of deceiving oneself to presume agreement where none exists is the most dangerous form of self-deception. And we all do it. Paul Ekman at UCSF, who focuses on people who can detect deception, says, our research has shown that most people are easily misled by deception, even policemen, psychiatrists, lawyers, and customs officials, and probably plaintiff's lawyers as well. They are unable to detect lies from simply talking to someone. We found that less than 1% of people who are accurate in their judgment in professions in which they're supposed to be paid to do that. Less than 1%. Stunning number. 
And Nirenberg and Cumming at the NIH have shown that the brain actually changes sensory inputs on the way in a way that the brain is tampering with the data. So we think we see what we're seeing. We're not. We should be very cautious about it. And, in fact, it's reminiscent of a quote from the Talmud that says, we do not see life as it is. We see life as we are. And I believe it's very insightful, 2,000 years old, pretty reliable, and hugely dangerous. And so we want to be self-aware to do this process. What are the precursors of deception? Optimism, trust, self-confidence. All these things can lead us to deceive ourselves. And if you don't have these qualities, you're going to fail in other parts of life. So this is a nifty little tradeoff that you have to make. How does it differ in China? You know, we have Aristotle versus Confucius. And it really is Confucius and the Tao and the Tao Te Ching that lays out the basis for a lot of philosophical things. It's kind of the equivalent of Aristotle's writings. Aristotle believed a lot, and many people in the West believe in individualism. But in China, it's more about harmony in the family, and we see that every day still. It's about debate and confrontation in the West. It's about the way and the middle way in China. The West views the world basically as simple as particles, objects, and categories. It may be complex, but it's kind of simple. The world is complex, forces, resonances, and context. Totally different way of thinking. Change is impossible. Change is inevitable. And exponential growth and mean reversion. I mean, that would be another way to say it. Nature is static. China believes control is hard. Contradiction is essential. Contradictions need to be eliminated. Scientific accomplishment is the basis of everything. Practical achievement is everything. So the Chinese were well ahead of the West in many important discoveries, including the printing press and the clock and fireworks and all that kind of stuff, but they never understood the science. They were the most mercantilist nation on the face of the planet for 1,000 years and never developed a system of economics. So there's something that was developed differently in the West from there. Discovery is venerated in the West. Problem solving is venerated in China. We're more kind of zoom in folks, and they're kind of more zoom out folks. So there's been some research on this, and I have three Chinese students working with me to try and fill this out a little bit more. In India, creativity in Hinduism is quite interesting. Ralph Hallman, not too far from here, has written about it. He's the best writer I've found. If you know others, please tell me about them. In his reading of the Hindu literature, he says, no place, nowhere describes explicitly the creative act. Hindu view of man does not encourage experimental inquiry. There are three key differences between Hinduism and the West. It's focused on the religious experience as opposed to the scientific experience. The universe is permanent, no novelty. That doesn't mean there are cycles. There are cycles. It's creative destruction. That's where Schumpeter's phrase came from. His assistant was a Hindu woman, and Shiva and all that sort of thing. And an individual cannot be unique. It's very much like the Asian, the Chinese view, whereas we believe every individual is unique from birth. In Hinduism, there are some similarities, however, which are, I think, quite interesting. The four stages of the creative process that we've talked about in terms of preparation, incubation, illumination, and verification are very similar to the Hindu process of enlightenment. Preparation is devotion, vision of God, continuous information input, exploration of thought, incubation, truth is eternal, discipline of yoga from an intellectual point of view. Inspiration, very similar to the Western aha. This is where you have an inspirational moment. And then verification, the outward representation of your new insight about God to others. It's an amazing correlation between the Hindu way of thinking and our way of thinking, except the areas of application are quite different. Another area that I hope to explore in the coming weeks and months. So the process is similar, but the focus on religion versus science is quite different. Now, this is traditional India. As we know, traditional India is rapidly going away, and many of them are educated over here. So if their epigenomes are turned on, then they're learning the same thing we are. And I guess they are. So I hope I've convinced you that we have really two different things here, conventional problem solving and problem finding and problem solving. 
One is where the problem is defined. That's the normal operating world that we all live in. The other where the problem is not defined. Problem solving process is defined and tested, but there's no clear problem solving process on the other side. One has limited search. The other has very broad search. One has a rapid focus on solution. The other has delayed hypothesis formulation. One efficiency is the key to look for the 80-20 solutions. The other is to seek anomalies. One is skilled experts with experience. The other is by associative explorers. One is experts acting alone, and the other is in groups. So these couldn't be more different. They're not sort of the same, and if you try to merge them, you'll end up with probably neither, and then one's fast and one's slow. So what does this mean for all of us? Well, I'd like to think of it in four areas, observation, reflection, conversation, and analysis. And in observation, that's where we address issues like search, the periphery, anomalies, dominant designs, paradoxes, and direct experience. In reflection, we think about zoom in, zoom out thinking, suspended judgment, finding missing elements, restructuring the data, juxtaposing it by association, using muses and sleep. And in conversations, we think about contrasting views, setting the pace and the agenda, and framing the issues, generating hypotheses a little bit more on the conventional side. And then in analysis, it's gathering systematic evidence, hypothesizing, classifying, categorizing, and naming. So there are four stages here, and one way to remember them is ORCA. That's the reason it's ORCA, is because, first of all, it stands for observation, reflection, conversation, and analysis, and secondly, because I gave this talk the first time at Woods Hole. So they were close, so that's why it's called ORCA. So hopefully that's a little bit of a guide to you. You know you're on the right track when you have searched the periphery broadly. You've used the noble method. You've seen the world through the eyes of others. You've identified emergent dominant designs. You've discovered problems. You've zoomed in, zoomed out, slowed down, identified paradoxes and anomalies, bisociated, and conversed with sunny pessimists. So if you can get 10 out of 10, you win. You are definitely on the right road. It's not a meeting. It's a process. It's not schedule-driven. It's insight-driven. It's not first-day solutions. It's delayed hypotheses. It's not focused. It's broad search. It's not interdisciplinary. It's inter- and cross-disciplinary. It's not only practitioners. It's practitioners and critics of the field and people outside the field. It's not just brainstorming. It's sustained conversations. It's not just day work. It's day and night work, and it's not full-time. It's in the background. So it's really, really different. Do you all know about the National Academies Tech Futures Initiative? This is a program that's been running for seven or eight years now, at least in this room in November, and they've used basically a variation of this process, and it's very, very successful. So they formed leadership groups, solicited challenges, selected a challenge for the group. We've done one that was called From Cells to Cell Phones. Another was Genetics and Infectious Diseases. We're doing one on large data management systems now. We've done one on prosthetics for the body and mind. So these are really wonderful meetings, and they follow this prescription here. So this not only is theory. This has worked. We're on our eighth year of that now here, and I ran several of these things for 15 years at McKinsey as well, so I'm pretty sure that they're pretty effective. And, you know, at the National Academies, these are some of the ones we mentioned, but it's also in the grand challenges for engineering. So all these methods are effective there. So that's it. So creativity in this view is to produce insight through imaginative skill. It's the highest order of minds, as William James has said, and creativity is a primary measure of our humanity, according to Mike Chick-Mahai, and it may be a defining characteristic for Western culture. Thank you very much. Thank you.